Uh, this lecture is named in honor of one of the past members of the Oberlin Math Department, Fuzzy Vance, whose original name is not Fuzzy, uh, it was Sticky, and uh, he was uh, chair of the department for 29 years. Um, so we'd like to thank the generous donors that uh, made this lecture series possible. Uh, we'd also like to thank you all for coming here today, and afterwards there will be uh, refreshments and snacks outside in the hall if you can stick around for a few minutes. I'd like to welcome our distinguished visitor and speaker, Professor Craig <coughs> Gilbo from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Um, Craig and Rick Ansel started the topology uh, research program at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, which is now has a graduate program and is thriving, well respected. Uh, Craig did his thesis in four dimensional manifolds, has dabbled in low dimensional manifolds, high dimensional manifolds, and infinite dimensional manifolds. Um, so please join me in welcoming our speaker, Craig Gilbo. He's going to teach us about the swingers.
The strategies are eerily similar, even though they're proving very different things. And I'll, I'll kind of try to get that point across as we go. Um, the technique is often referred to now as the eilenberg maser swindle. Um, that will require some explanation. Uh, I looked up the definition of swindle. This is usually not a good thing. Uh, to obtain by fraud or deceit, that's usually what, not what a mathematician wants associated uh, to their name. Um, so, is that okay? Do we, do we allow proofs that are uh, obtained by a swindle? The answer will be that sometimes we do. Okay, I want to warm up. I think this is perhaps the original swindle. Uh, there's a series, infinite series called the uh, Crosby series, which is just the sum of n equals 0 minus 1 to the n. So it's 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. Do that forever. So it's an infinite series. And if you want to add it up, all you need to do is uh, start putting in some parentheses. Parentheses are on the 1 and the minus 1, and then alternate. And you quickly see that you just get 0 plus 0 plus 0. So obviously the sum in that series is 0. Um, but I want to do that again. I want you to give me a do-over here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just move the parentheses a little bit. Rather than putting the parentheses around the first two terms, I'm going to leave that one behind. I'm going to slide the parentheses over. Well. We're going to get 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, which clearly means the sum of that series is 1. So we have a nice correlation, which is that 0 is equal to 1. Uh, or maybe we've been swindled here. This is the sort of swindle that we're talking about. Uh, obviously, we, we prefer not to have 0 equal 1. That would ruin a lot of good mathematics. And so what can we say about that? Well. First of all, I'd like to ignore the, 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 the big uh, problem that we just observed. And this series came up, I'm teaching Calc 2 this semester, and this series came up recently. Um, 1 over, sum of 1 over n times n plus 1. You get these fractions here. If you stare at those fractions carefully enough, you realize they have something in common. 1 half <coughs> is just 1 minus a half. And 1 sixth is 1 half minus a third. And uh, 1 twelfth is a third minus a fourth, and so on. If you slide the parentheses over like I just did, you get 1 minus, well, 0 plus 0 plus 0. Um, I may have a, a sign mistake in there, but you get the point. And you get 1. But it turns out that the answer here is correct, and in fact, this can be made rigorous um, if, if you uh, work at it a little bit. So, you know, it's such a beautiful technique, you would hate to throw it away just because it gives you the wrong answer sometimes. And so, um, <laughs> so what, what are we going to do about that? So, first of all, some lessons. Beware about the infinite process. Okay, you, you can fool yourself, and I think we, you know, we may have gotten fooled. I hope I fooled a couple people with that first series. Um, definitions are crucial. The, the problem with that first series giving two different answers is that we've got to be really careful about uh, the definition of what it means to sum an infinite series. So it wasn't really the technique, it was our interpretation of, of the information that we get. Okay, so in fact, under normal series, we wouldn't say that either 0 or 1 was the right answer. We say that that series doesn't converge. And so in that case, we have to throw away both of those. Well, you need to give up on a really neat idea if it can sometimes work out. So what we'd like to do is, uh, is uh, stick with it and just be careful about how we use it. So one lesson is any proof I show you, be skeptical. But I'll try to justify why in the, in the uh, context I'm presenting it to you that everything is OK. I'm respecting the definition. Okay, so now I'd like to look at a couple more advanced swindles that turn out to be true. Um, I chose these specifically because one is very much in the spirit of Eilenberg's theorem, and the other is very much in the spirit of uh, Barry Mason's theorem. 
Okay, so the first one in, involves just cardinality of sets, or the comparing the sizes of sets. There's a very important definition here, which says that if you have a pair of sets, um, you consider them to have the same size. This definition looks very simple to us now, but it was a real breakthrough definition by Cantor. Sets have the same size if there is a bijective function from one to the other. So on the left, I have the set A, on the right, the set B. And the fact that I have a function that's both one to one and onto between those, that's the definition of what it means to say those sets have the same size. Okay, so for example, if you count the uh, vowels in the alphabet, A, E, I, O, U, when we say there are five vowels, what we're really saying is that there is a bijection from the set of numbers one through five to that set of vowels. You may not think of it as a function when you're counting, but you could be saying f of one, f of two, f of three, and you're forming a bijection. So that seems like a pretty uncontroversial definition of what it means for two sets to have the same size. Um, but if you're going to believe that definition, now you have to start believing some things that are a little bit weird. If you take the set of all counting numbers and you add one more element to it, the set you get back is the same size as the one you started with. Because you can build a bijective function, you just send, uh oh, I have a typo there. I, I should, if I want to go from left to right, I should take f of uh, n equals n minus 1. Um, but in any case, um, well, this is sometimes called the Hilbert Hotel because of the famous analogy that uh, Hilbert was a, a hotel manager. He had an uh, infinite collection of rooms numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up. He was completely booked up one night when another potential guest showed up and he didn't want to turn this person away and he certainly didn't want to kick anybody out of their room. So he just asked them all to move down the hall one slot. Person in room one, move to room two. Person in room two, move to room three, and so on. Everybody still had a room, and when they were done moving, he was able to take this new person and put them into room one. Uh, that's, that's sort of one of the amazing things about infinity. Um, it gets even more interesting if you, uh, if you take the counting numbers and you throw half of them away. Throw all the uh, odd numbers away, those sets are still the same size if you respect our definition because the function that just sends each number n to its double is both one to one and on to. So. Now, you might start to believe, well, all infinite sets must be the same size then, but another famous fact that uh, I think Cantor is probably responsible for is that the uh, the counting numbers and the real numbers are not at the same size. No matter how hard you try, you're never going to get a bijection between those two sets. The next question was, well, where do the rationals fit in? The, the rationals are, there are a lot more rationals than there are counting numbers. Uh, but there are a lot of real numbers that aren't rational, so the rationals fit somewhere in between those two. And, uh, now, I'm sure a lot of you know the answer to this. You know that the rationals have the same size as one of those two sets. I think I might be able to show you a proof that's different than, than what you've seen before. And uh, we're going to do it with an infinite swing. Okay, so what, one of the things this uh, theorem requires is the notion of when one set is less than or equal to the other. Okay, and the definition is sort of an obvious one. If you can get a one-to-one -one function, doesn't have to be onto anymore, from set A to set B, then you would say that uh, set A is less than or equal to set B. The way I like to think of it is there's enough room inside of set B for an entire copy of set A. Okay, so you see the three-point set A on the left, and you see the copy of A sitting inside of B, which is the, the three points in the image. And there are some left over. Okay, so, for example, the counting numbers now are clearly... Notice with the rationals, I switched over to just the positive rationals. That, that's really just for convenience here. So, um, let's take just the positive <coughs> rationals. And now this becomes easy to get a one-to-one -one function, right? Every, every counting number 
is already rational, so you just uh, send every number to itself. That function is far from being untrue. Um, because, you know, <laughs> one half, one third, three quarters, those all get left out. Remarkably, though, you can flip it around fairly easily, and you can get uh, an injective function from the positive rationals into the counting numbers. <coughs> what I'm going to do is for each uh, rational number p over q, I'm just going to send it to the number 2 to the p times 3 to the q. Now, I should say, take that rational and first reduce it into lowest the terms so that uh, everybody gets the same answer when they do this. And what you notice then is, uh, it's easy to see that function is one to one. Not only that, but gosh, we're hardly using any of the counting numbers. There is room for the rationals to fit in there with lots of room to spare. Okay, well, if the first set is less than or equal to the second, and the second is less than or equal to the first, does that mean they're the same size? That's, that's not immediate, right? Because somehow our job becomes to take these very approximate type functions and turn them into an on-the-nose bijective function between those two sets. That turns out to be a fairly deep fact, but it is true that here's the theorem. If set A is less than or equal to B and vice versa, then they have to be the same. Cantor was the one who invented a lot of this stuff, and my understanding is that uh, Cantor said this is true, and even as rigorous as he was, he never bothered to prove it. Schroeder proved it, but he proved it wrong. <laughs> and then Bernstein came along and uh, got the proof right. So I, I don't know if for sure. Uh, the internet says this is true, so I guess <laughs> to me it's, it's going to be true at least for tonight. Um, but what I'd like to do is actually show you a proof of this. And I'm going to get us started with this picture. The set A is the set of points inside of that green oval. And the set B is the set of all yellow points inside, the, um, inside that uh, rectangle. And now what I've done is I've shown that, OK, A is less than or equal to B means there's a copy of A over here sitting inside of B. Right? We, we take some injective function and we use it to create a copy of A sitting inside of B. But notice there's also a bunch of stuff left over. R stands for remainder. That's the extra stuff when you fit A inside of B. And then vice versa, we can put B inside of A. And there's going to be a lot of extra stuff left over here, presumably. OK, so now we want to get those to match up perfectly with, with no remainders. So here's step one, where I put b inside of a. Notice I threw away the label of function. Now, I, I really just want to think of b as sitting inside of a. It's a little informal, but I think the idea is a little uh, clearer if I write it that way. And then the remainder, s. I've called it S1 because I'm going to show you another copy of the remainder in a second. Um, I'm now going to remember that uh, B sits inside of A, but A also sits inside of B. So I'm going to take this copy of B, and I'm going to put that copy of A inside it, which also contains that copy of B. So now I've got a copy of A with a copy of B inside it, with a remainder of S1. And then inside of uh, B, I've got a copy of A with the remainder of R1. And then inside of that, I've got a co another copy of A. Uh, whoops, another copy of B with the remainder of S2. I can do this forever. So inside of every copy of A, I have a copy of B, which inside of that has a copy of A. You can see the infinite process uh, churning here. So I can do this forever. Now, notice that all these remainders I am producing here are disjoint from one another. That's sort of the nature of being the remainder. And so what I've been able to do is to write A as an infinite union of all of those remainders 
I use the square union symbol to stand for disjoint union. So you're supposed to notice that none of those sets I have here have any elements in common. In the C down there at the end, that's what I can, I, I use the letter C for core. Those are the points that are in all of these things. So there are going to be some, some elements that when you do this infinitely often, they're in that infinite intersection. Okay, so A is equal to an, an infinite union of copies of the remainder S, the copy of the remainder R, and then the core is here. Okay, so you just see it by looking at the picture, right? You see the uh, S1 here, S1, R1, R1, S2, and so on. But now remember the thing inside the yellow there, the big yellow rectangle, that's just a copy of, uh, of B. So if you throw away the first S1, you've got exactly the same expression. <coughs> Nothing surprising here, right? It's always our saying is that B fits inside of A, in the remainder is a copy of S. <coughs> we said that before. Okay, but now it's time for perhaps the swindle, perhaps it's a legal swindle. Um, let's see. What I'm going to do first of all is I'm just going to take this line for B <coughs> and I'm just going to slide it over by one notch just so things match up a little bit. <coughs> okay, so notice I. It's the same expression I had on the previous slide, except I slid everything over, and I've put in some parentheses. Okay? And now if you drop down, it's all I have done, I said, after mild reordering. The reordering, it's all I did is I took the lower row, and I switched the order of those two elements. When you're taking a union of sets, you don't care if it's A union B or B union A. <coughs> union is, is commutative. So certainly that's a legal move. And now, if you look at this uh, second <coughs> expression here, up above S1 you've got, or sorry, up above S2 you've got S1. Those are two copies of the same set. <coughs> you know, they came about the same way. They're a remainder <coughs> that you get when, uh, when you plug uh, A, no, B into A. <coughs> And then the R ones are, well, they exactly match up. Okay. Well, if all of the S's are really copies of the same set, and the R's are copies of the same set, then it's easy to uh, use those arrows to build a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two things. And both sets contain the set C, so, um, so with this picture, we, we can see that we can actually build a one-to-one -one correspondence from A to B. I have to say that I, I proved this theorem in my topology class several times, and I never quite got the proof. I never felt, I could prove it, I could, I could walk away feeling like I did all the details, and I never felt like I really understood it until I read uh, on Terence Tao's uh, blog page that you should think of this theorem as the infinite swindle. And now that I've thought of it this way, to me, it seems very clear what's happening here. If you, if you read the proofs in the books, um, there are a lot of formulas that are hard to follow. But I, to me, this is the, the right way to see it. If you wanted to write down a function using this idea, you'd probably have a fairly easy time doing it. OK, so that is my uh, Eilenberg type swindle. It's sort of an algebraic thing. It's a symbol switching thing. In some ways, this one might be even a little harder than Eilenberg's. Uh, Okay, so anyway, we, we get that these sets are equivalent. Now, the one I really like is Mazur's, because, of course, I'm a topologist, and Mazur's theorem was a topology theorem. Um, his was about spheres embedded in high-dimensional spaces. The one I'm going to give you is involving uh, knots in three-dimensional space. It's just much more visual, and the proof and theorem are, are just as good, I think, as, uh, as the original. So first of all, there's an entire area of topology called knot theory. And what we do when we study knot theory is we study simple closed curves sitting in three-dimensional space. And these are the sort of knots that you probably tie on a daily basis. Um, we may give them different names than you gave them when you were in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or something. But uh, you know, the, there's the trefoil, which is the simple overhand knot, the simplest 
But one thing that's a little different is once we tie the knot, we fuse the ends together to lock in <coughs> what we just did. Other, otherwise, as a topologist, you know, we would say it could just be deformed right back to the original string that we started with. So that's really the only difference between our knots and the everyday knots is we, we fuse the ends together after. So we have a figure eight knot that's a little bit more complicated than the trefoil. And actually, this is a pretty important one. The unknot is considered a knot, and it actually plays an important role. It's, obviously, it's a, kind of the simplest one. And then I put this wild knot down below just to say that when, when people do knot theory, they usually exclude wild knots because, well, to be honest, they're a little bit too hard to work with. Uh, what we like to do with knots is what I did up above, which is thicken them up into a tube. And uh, if you have infinitely many crossings there, there's no way of really thickening that up without swallowing part of the knot. So. Um, this is really unfortunate because wild knots are a really cool thing to work with. It's the sort of topology that, uh, that uh, Professor Calcutt and I do quite often is, is to work with strange objects like this. Um, but somehow they get kicked out of knot theory. But don't, don't feel bad for them. They're going to make a comeback a little bit later. So we'll, we'll talk about them still. <laughs> what your job is if you're a knot theorist is to figure out ways to distinguish one knot from another. So here are two famous knots. One on the left is a square knot, and the one on the right is a granny knot. Um, notice both of them, you're going to see that trefoil knot appear twice. But on the left-hand side, well, when I go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, I've changed some of the crossings. The question is, can one of those be moved around so that it looks just like the other? And if the answer is no, how, how are you going to prove that doing mathematics? Well, that, that's a pretty big subject to, to bite off. And so we will uh, um, we'll probably not be proving theorems about that. But we will prove a pretty important theorem from knot theory, um, which is more in the, the spirit of uh, the topic for this talk. Um, by the way, just so you can appreciate the difficulty of being a knot theorist, does anybody recognize this knot here? You can guess if you want. Unknot. It's the unknot. Yeah, exactly. So, um, <coughs> so this is one thing you would be hoping to do. I don't know. Could you tell that, or was that a guess? That was a guess. Okay. <laughs> if you go online, you can actually find a motion picture, or you kick it into motion, and it just comes apart beautifully. And so, you know, you, you can sort of think about how, how, would, you, how would you do that mathematically? Um, obviously, you might be able to attempt it with a piece of string and, you know, with a shoelace, and you could form that and see if you can unravel it. But uh, building an entire theory of mathematics, I should say, this is not just a, a hobby area of mathematics. It plays a very important role in topology. Uh, if you want to understand three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional manifolds, you just have to understand knot theory. It's what, knots are sort of one of the things that make dim three dimensions different than other dimensions. Okay. Well, you know, mathematicians, when you give them a collection of objects, they love to add structure to it. So one of the things mathematicians like to do is they like to put some algebraic structure on their objects. And one way to add algebraic structure to knot theory is to define an operation on them. We define like an addition operation on knots. The way I'm going to add the knot on the left to the knot on the right is I'm going to cut them both open and I'm going to splice them together, just like in that picture. That's called the connected sum of the two knots. And the notation that tends to be used is with that hashtag symbol. So the knot on the left is k, the knot on the right is j, and the new knot I get is k sum j. So, but once you see that operation, your algebraic mind can't help kicking in, and you might ask yourself, uh, well, first of all, I didn't even bother with the commutative property. You could just rotate that knot, and you would then have j on the left and k on the right, and you would see that uh, k sum j and j sum k are, are the same thing. Um, 
Associativity is also almost immediate. If you line those three knots up and you splice J to K and L to what you have left, or if you sort of change the order a little bit, you're going to get that big knot that I have there. So it turns out that you have the associative property. K sum J sum L is the same as if you take K and you sum it with J and L. I might be skipping over a few little details, but I think that's a pretty believable thing. Um, the other thing is there's an identity element. And the identity element is the unknot. So just like the numbers 0 and 1 shouldn't be respected, just be disrespected just because they're so simple, the unknot shouldn't be disrespected. It plays this really important role in knot theory that when you start summing knots, uh, the unknot is the identity element. Okay, so again, the point is that when I add the unknot on, I can just deform that down so that it looks just like the knot I started with. Well, if anybody has been in a group theory class, there's probably one question you're just waiting to have answered. And that is, are there inverses? You would, we have associativity, we have an identity, we would really like to have inverses as well. Okay. What would that mean? That would mean somehow you have a knot on the left, you're going to splice it to a knot on the right in some way so that those overcrossings and undercrossings sort of cancel out and at the end you can sort of take a complicated picture and turn it into the unknot. So is that possible? That, that's the question that you really want to address if you're trying to understand the algebraic structure on knots under, under this operation. What do you think? Is it possible? If you took, say, the mirror image of a knot and you splice the two together, might they unravel for you? I've been asking a lot of, I think to, to, the, to a lot of people, this is really not uh, obvious at all. So that's what you want in a good theorem, right? Is that it's not clear which way the answer should go. And, uh, well, the theorem is that, well, it's bad news, I guess, on one level. There are no inverses. So the only knots that have inverses, the only knot is, is the identity element. The identity always has an inverse, right? So uh, this is about as bad as it can get. No, no knots have inverses. If you, if you have an honest-to-goodness knot that's not the unknot, <laughs> I hope I'm making some sense. It makes sense in my head, anyway. Um, if you have an honest-to-goodness knotted knot, then you're not going to be able to undo that knot just by splicing something else onto it. Uh, that's what I'd like to convince you of in the time I have left here. Okay, so here's an idea for a proof. Take your knot K, well, this is going to be a proof by a contradiction, okay? I'm going to assume that this knot K has an inverse, which is J. And then I'm going to try, well, it's not really, it doesn't have to be a proof by contradiction. What I would like to conclude that is that I must have really started with the unknot in the first place. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up infinitely many of these knots. You can kind of see a swindle coming, so <laughs> your, your swindle radar should be up here. Um, so notice this infinite knot, I'm going to call K sum J sum K sum J sum. That's a perfectly reasonable name for it. Um, and then I'm going to start just doing some algebra. So there is the, you know, in, in symbols, that's what I've got. And I'm going to put parentheses around the first two. And then I'm going to put parentheses around the second uh, two. Parentheses, well, inside the parentheses you have K and J. And our assumption is that those two undo each other. So what I should have is just a whole bunch of unknots strung together. And that should be the, that's my symbol for the unknot, by the way. It's just a circle. That, that should be the unknot, right? And then, if I shift the parentheses over, um, I can leave K behind, and I have K sum with the unknot, and that should be K. Well, that's what I'm trying to prove, right? That K and the unknot are the same thing. And so we've got a proof of that here. Um, 
Except that if you, it doesn't really hold up very well to close examination because notice, if I go back to this picture, that's really not a knot there, right? If a knot is supposed to be a simple closed curve in space, and this one goes off to infinity. And if you were to string infinitely many unknots together, you don't get a simple closed curve. You get, you get a line that bends from that direction all the way back and then just goes forward. So if you believe that proof, you, you were swindled. But I want to show you how to fix that proof. And in fact, uh, remember we said don't give up on a, a good technique. Let, let's see what we can do to it. So here's the trick. We're going to use a wild knot. Remember, I said these guys would make their comeback. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make these knots get smaller and smaller and smaller till they shrink down to a point in space. Now, it, it is a wild knot now. It, uh, it has infinitely many crossings. We try to avoid those, but we're not trying to prove a theorem about wild knots. They're just going to be a tool to prove theorems about the kind of knots we're interested in. So nobody said that we can't use a wild knot along the way, and uh, that's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, so this is a, if you, you have to think about this perhaps, but you really do get a simple closed curve here. Um, you have the, the line going this way, the line going back, and then they both meet up at that red point there. That's a simple closed curve. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put bubbles around the first two of those guys, bubbles around the second two, bubbles around the third two, and inside of each of those bubbles I'm going to do all my magic. The, the fact that I have uh, K and J in there, and they are assumed to be inverses of one another, means that uh, I can undo them. Okay, and then I go do the same magic in <coughs> the second bubble, and I do this. I do that all the way. And notice on the bottom there, it's kind of wobbly, but that is just an unknot. Uh, you know, it goes up and down, up and down, but it meets that point. And uh, there's my unknot. So what I have just shown you is that that wild knot that I just created is really what was really just the unknot. Maybe it wasn't even wild at all. It was just a, an exotic version of the unknot. Well. Now I'm going to come back to the same picture, and I'm going, to put, I'm going to leave that first knot behind, and I'm going to put bubble around the second and the third one, the fourth and the fifth one, the sixth and the seventh one, and so on. And I'm going to work that magic inside of each of those bubbles individually. Okay. Well, if I do it that way, you see that that exact same knot that I started with is really just the knot K. Here it is. And it's summed with the unknot, but that's k. So what I've just shown is that k is equal to the unknot. Remember, the assumption was that what I was trying to show is that if a knot has an inverse, then it's really the unknot. So by working with that assumption, <coughs> I've shown that k really is just the unknot. <coughs> okay. Now there appears a little bit of sleight of hand I used to give you there, which I, sh I should own up to. Um, when I was unknotting those inside those bubbles, I had to be sh careful to keep the outs put the outside back where it was. And this slide is, is sort of intended to uh, give me a chance to say that you really can do that. Okay. For example, um, when I had the first two guys here that I wanted to unknot, if I just put a bubble around everything else, what I would do is I would go ahead and I would do my magic to unknot this, and then just at the end of it, I would put the bubble back where it started. So somehow that bubble got bigger, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's an artifact of the graphics, not, uh, not the proof. So you unravel those two, you keep this stuff hermetically sealed so you don't mess with it, and then once you've got this the way you want it, you put those back in place, and then you go inside of the next bubble. Whoops. You go inside of the, the next bubble and you do your magic here, where you have to be able to do it so that stuff on the outside doesn't get moved. There's a little bit of uh, 
three-dimensional topology that gets used there, but nothing, nothing that we couldn't understand in complete detail if we wanted to take another 10 minutes or so understanding that. Okay, but then, you know, you, you continue to do that. So you, you keep the extra stuff in a bubble so that once you've got these two guys unraveled, then you can go on and you can move here. So this really does hold water. It, uh, um, it's one of the legal swindles. It's a little bit, you know, of the same flavor of that infinite series. You know, when the infinite series wasn't really converging, we could do things that were completely bogus. But in this case, the uh, creating the wild knot that converges down to a point is sort of the analog of working with an infinite series that actually converges. And you can make each of those moves legal if you're careful. And this is very much the argument that Barry Mazur came up with when he was a young 20-year-old mathematician um, to solve a famous problem at the time, that this uh, generalized Schoenfeld theory. It's an inter interesting story about him. He, he was an undergraduate at the time. He never finished his undergraduate degree. But within a year or two, he was awarded a PhD by Princeton. And he never looked back. <laughs> That's not a suggestion, by the way. That's, that's just a comment. That's an interesting story. Uh, it feels like famous problems nowadays take a lot of machinery and a long, very long paper. And these guys were proving really famous results just by being extremely clever. And, uh, I, I, I think their fame benefited from the fact that their proofs were so notorious. Uh, which, you know, that's not such a bad thing either. Now, one, one thing I wanted to, uh, on course slide, I've got time to talk about it, fortunately. Um, you might feel, be feeling very <coughs> disappointed that uh, the set of knots under this operation does not form a group. But what I wanted to mention, and this, um, you know, this is really a topic for another talk, but it is possible to make that collection into a group. Um, what we have to do is we have to consider some knots equivalent that are not really equal to each other. So we put an equivalence relation on it, uh, which is called the uh, concordance relation on the set of all knots. Okay. And so then you get what's called the knot concordance group. And this is an object that's uh, a subject of extensive research going on as we speak. There are people who, who uh, still spend lots of their careers uh, studying this knot concordance group. And it does turn out that the inverse of a knot is the mirror image. I wasn't just throwing that out to uh, confuse you earlier. The, the inverse for a knot k is its mirror image. Now when you put those together, you don't get the unknot, but you get something that's equivalent to the unknot under this concordance relation. Okay, so I can, I can tell you more about that if you're interested, but I, th I think that's a little too technical for right now. Um, so as I said, case some its uh, mirror image is isn't the unknot, but it it is the identity element in this concordance. <clears throat> okay, and so now it turns out that you really do have a very rich and very interesting group. Uh, I think this is one of those examples in, of infinite abelian groups, Jack. <laughs> that uh, might be worth studying. Some. <laughs> and, uh, Sure. I think that's as much as I had to say. I'm happy to say that. I'm open to questions. Yeah. Is there more than one knot that's concordant to the unknot? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty big class of groups. Uh, Every knot, when paired with its uh, reflection, those tend to be very different knots. But they, they all, so you, a lot of things get lumped together uh, in this process. But there's enough rich structure that, that there's still a lot to be studied there. Yeah. Was Mazur aware of Eilenberg's discovery of the swindle when he did his own thing? Or? Well, okay, so uh, he asked whether Mazur was aware of Eilenberg's proof. Actually, I, even though I wrote them in the order I did, it was Mazur who came in a little before Eilenberg. And I, I guess I don't really know the answer to that. My, my guess is that uh, there, there would have really been no need for, for them to have, have seen that before. Um, but, but yeah, that's a good question. I, re I really don't know. Um, 
But one thing I didn't say is even though Eilenberg's proof was really algebra, he was also a topologist. And uh, the technique he used gets used all the time. In fact, one of the reasons I put this talk together was because there was one year in our topology seminar in Milwaukee where it seemed like every day somebody was using some sort of swindle in their proof. And sometimes it was an algebraic one like Eilenberg's. Sometimes it was Mazur's. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a good, good question, though. I'm not sure if they were aware of what the other was doing. Yeah? I'm just kind of confused what it actually means for like a wild knot to just eventually like, collapse into a point. Like, as you zoom in, what does that look like? Well, it, it, it's sort of a fractal type object, right? It's, no matter how you zoom in, it's going to look the same. But remember, the definition of a knot is just a simple closed curve. So you just need it to, uh, you need a, I don't want to use technical terms here, but I'll say an embedding. You need a circle, an object, a subset of free space that's homeomorphic to a circle. And if you, if you think about it, that object satisfies, you know, you can find a one-to-one a -one onto function that will take the circle onto that object. And so that qualifies then as a, as a knot of some sort. Uh, wild because, it, um, you know, often we say it's wild because it can't be done with a smooth knot. It's one, one way of saying what a wild knot is. Uh, but it is a simple closed curve. That's, that's really all a knot has to be. I uh, yeah. So, what exactly uh, demarcates the border of what constitutes an Eilenberg Mazur swindle proof? Is it just like uh, something just like that seems too simple that plays with associativity on an infinite um, operation, or is it there's like something? In this yeah. So yeah. So he's asking what you know what what is it that makes the proof of an Eilenberg Mazur swindle? And yeah, my my guess is there's no well defined version of that. I I, I showed. Uh, Dr. Kalk had a version earlier today, which um, I think is actually different than either of these, really. But it does involve this uh, infinite shifting of parentheses. So um, that's probably the most characteristic thing of it, is that you, you take some infinite string, and just by shifting parentheses, you can look, make it look completely different in one incarnation than it does in another. Yeah. Just a real beginner to not theory. Going back to the gray knot and the square knot, like, yes. what's the answer? Oh, th th they are different knots. They are different okay. knots. And what notion does that come out of? Or... How would you show it? Hmm? How would you show it? Yeah. Well, um, I guess that's a lot to ask. Uh, you know, I, I, I have given talks <laughs> on that topic before. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing what tools have been developed by knot theorists. One of the famous things about that example is the most basic tool. One, one thing that people often do with knots, and this is not going to make sense to everybody in the room, so I'll, I'll apologize in advance, but you look at the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. And if those are different, you know the knots are different. In that case, it turns out that they aren't different. They are the same. And so you, you actually need some other trick to distinguish those. And uh, there are these famous objects called knot polynomials. Uh, there's a simple set of rules for how you can always change any knot to any other knot by just changing the crossings mm -hmm. and doing certain moves. And if you keep track of all those moves, you can build a polynomial. You, what you do is you take your knot and you do that until you get to the unknot. Mm -hmm. And you sort of write down some rules for what you did on the way, at the end you have a polynomial. And then there's a theorem that says, if two knots have different polynomials, they're different knots. And th that's a case where uh, one, of, one of the new polynomials, new and then it was only discovered about uh, 25 or 30 years ago, um, will distinguish between those knots, whereas some, some of the other techniques won't. So, so th there is a very precise, <laughs> Calculational way to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but it would take a little bit of ex explaining. Yeah. So it's a different talk. Anybody else? Yeah. I guess it's a case where the the stupid be true or probably isn't doesn't apply. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I, I wonder what is there any grant, is there a particular branch of mathematics where swindles are more prevalent? Oh. Um, Boy, they're, they're really prevalent in topology, I have to say. But where, where they come up in topology almost always is by studying non-compact objects. 
which are by nature constructed by, usually by some infinite process. And so it's almost uh, inevitable that some sort of infinite <laughs> algebra is going to get associated with it. And uh, when you're lucky, one of these techniques is just what you need. Yeah? So that, that's the weird thing to me about the second swindle is it didn't look like there was anything infinite really going on. Well, it's it's some, yeah. yeah. But, but in, in some sense, a wild knot is constructed no, before by... Before you did that, like, oh, yeah. that you know, oh, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and, you know, that was the same thing uh, with Mazur's proof. I, would say. I think that was the thing that made it such a shock when he announced this proof, is that... Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, he was studying very finite objects, and he just came across this uh, really remarkable proof which used infinite processes to prove something. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. The, um, the problem at the beginning doesn't have to be an infinite process for you to take advantage of this technique. Yeah? So those, those two infinite knots that we had, the one that worked and, and the one that didn't work, are they not only a marker? Well, you know, the, the first one, I, I was just uh, being a little sloppy there. I, I, I showed you the idea, but by letting those strands run all the way up to infinity, they really never met up. So it was really not legal for me to call that a knot. It was, it was really an embedding of a line. It was just a copy of the line embedded in free space. So they had both ends running out in the same direction. And so I, I, I was sort of bending the rules there. A little bit like we were bending the rules when we summed that infinite series by just uh, putting parentheses where we wanted, right? We, we sort of ignored the whole definition of what it really means for an infinite series to be summable. Uh, the operations looked pretty good, but, but we were breaking a lot of rules. And I, I was breaking a lot of rules when I didn't force that, uh, that knot to converge down and become a simple closed curve. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I think the way you proved the, uh, <coughs> the real number and the uh, the, uh, the set of the real uh, no, the set of the rational number is the same as the set of the common number. Right. When you prove that, it, isn't that just a restatement of uh, Grundy series? Because you can either write a as like uh, as one. Uh, uh, union B, and later, and you can prove that A equals B. Um, well, the, the 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 thing is, what what the, the proof I gave you was was purely set theory, right? So the thing about set theory is there is there is no controversy about what you mean by a union of infinitely many sets. The union is just a collection of all objects that are in at least one of those sets, and so. Um, you, you don't need to worry about convergence or anything like that in, in the case of, of an infinite union of sets. And also, I, I was careful about the sets being disjoint because then you really didn't have to keep track of the elements when you started switching orders. So, so in some sense, uh, infinite series are more delicate than the set theory, even though that theorem, I, I'm sure, felt a little bit abstract to people. Um, on some levels, the concepts there are a little bit easier than they are in infinite series. You have, you have more rules you have to, to pay attention to. Yeah. So the, I think what you did is figuring out uh, like the one of the gas and the, yes. the other, right. or whatever. But if like you have uh, uh, like an integer number of pairs uh, in A, you can't have an integer like integer number of pairs in B because uh, you are lacking the term S1, no matter what. Like, how differently you go. So it's just, I, uh, well, I think it's just like the, uh, the way you draw the parentheses. You, if you shift it backwards, then you're left with the first uh, number or less. Okay, so, um, so on the first line, I have written A as a union of a bunch of S's in a bunch of R's, in all of those sets, all of the R's are equivalent to each other, and all of the S's are equivalent to each other. And so, um, the first thing I did was, 
I just took B, I had also written B as a union of R's and S's, except one of the S's was, is missing from, from the B here, right? So no, no controversy, I think, in the first one. Yeah. Um, and so it's all, notice all I did when I moved from this line down to this line was that I flipped the order of R1 and S2, so it's S2 union R1. I did that infinitely often, but it's all I was doing was switching order. Putting in the parentheses really doesn't do anything here, because the parentheses really have no meaning here. It's just sort of a, a way of organizing in your head what you should be thinking. Um, putting those parentheses around those numbers actually biased us towards thinking about that partial sum in a certain way. Um, but now the fact is, S1 and S2 are two copies of the same set. So I can get a bijection between these guys, a bijection between these, a bijection between these, between these. And if I fit all those together, I get one big bijection from the row here to the row here. So I'm pretty sure I didn't break any rules in, in a set theory in doing that. Yeah, but like in the graph you show, isn't that obvious that A is B plus S1? Uh, so if you choose, and then A and B are like proved to be equivalent. Yes. Yes. So, so here, here is the key slide, really, right here. That A is equal to the union of all those remainders plus C, and B is the union of all the same remainders plus C, except that one of them is missing. Okay. But the way we do it is we, we match them up by matching the S2 we match with the S1, the S3 gets matched with the S2, and so on. The R's just get matched with themselves. So it's really how I, how I choose their partner. When you build a bijection, for each element you're choosing a partner. And you have to do that in a way so that you get a bijective function. And I'm pretty sure that I chose partners here so that I match the rules of, of a bijection. I'm happy to talk to you about it more afterwards, but I, I want to make sure I don't leave anybody out here. Maybe this is a good place to stop and we can continue. Okay, sure. I'm happy outside. to answer questions. Uh, at the Please enjoy some uh, refreshments outside if you have time.